let me uh, open up and say um, I'm very pleased to uh, have Jeremy Chu from Lungara College and Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, BC, north of the border. I heard uh, Jeremy speak at a uh, Canadian Math Society meeting earlier in the winter, and I could, my my screen was resonating because of his energy. And I said, I got to invite this guy to come and talk to our conference. And so I'm so pleased that he's here to talk about a broader issue than just differential equations on strategies for active learning in a math class. So Jeremy, you're on. Uh, thank you for the warm introduction. So this is my talk, Strategies for Active Learning in a Math Class. I'm gonna give a quick overview. So I'm gonna give you a quick introduction. We're gonna go into an example where I'll ask you to talk about the moon and we'll chat together. I'll give you some theory about what active learning is and how it helps versus passive learning. I'm gonna give you a quiz and then the rest of the talk is just a, a bunch of examples that I hope you can try to implement some of them into your class. Strategies to use active learning. Okay, quick introduction. Hi, uh, I'm Jeremy. I'm the one in the black tie in the picture. I'm currently a instructor at Langara College. I'm also started my PhD just in September, back in, back in school doing more math. I also do first aid with St. John Ambulance. Uh, outside of math, I like to do, I like dogs, I like sports, I garden, I love coffee. Outside of math, I do more math. I love Pokemon, magic, and first aid. So I have more to anything that you wanna, if you wanna play magic, I'm always happy to play magic. Okay, anyways, so uh, let's let's pose a problem for the audience now, okay? This is called the dark side of the moon. So uh, a little bit of, of physics, bi uh, not biophysics, astrophysics, I guess. Due to tidal lock-in, we only see one side of the moon from the Earth. So uh, the Earth and, and the moon both rotate, and NASA has this really nice image kind of showing what's going on. Uh, with tidal locking, the smiley face always sees us. So we always see this side of the moon. The side opposite from us, the side that we don't see, looks like this. And you'll notice there's a lot more craters on that side. Okay, so one side from Earth, we see it. There's not many craters. And from the other side, there are a lot of craters. I'll pose this to the audience. Why are there more craters on the side that we don't see? Any, uh, any comments, you're welcome to just, just shout it out, unmute, type in chat. Why is it on the side we don't see there are more craters? Well, the Earth would be protecting the moon on its side, and so that would seem one re possible reason. Yes. So I think that's a that's a very plausible hypothesis, right? That uh, the side that has Earth, Earth is there, and therefore it's kind of like acting like a shield. Okay. So I think that's a very, very reasonable guess. In science, are hypotheses necessarily true? Well, of course not. We would need to verify the experiment by launching uh, sorry, we would need to verify the hypothesis by using an experiment. Can we realistically test this? Are we going to launch a bunch of craters at the moon and see if Earth acts as a shield, see if China acts as a shield? And uh, no, I don't think we should do that. And this is where I would highlight to my classes the power of mathematical modeling. So we can't actually launch a real world example because it's costly and we might offend the rest of Earth if it actually acts as a shield. We might offend the moon, avenge the, the moon people. But instead, we run a mathematical model. We define the Earth and the moon on a computer. We simulate them. We simulate a bunch of comets. We solve a bunch of equations, and we can see what happens. And if you run these models, it turns out that uh, no, Earth does not act as a shield. OK, so most of these models that I haven't actually run, I'm just uh, trusting with the internet. I don't know. I'm trusting the, the, that this has been shown that uh, math models show that Earth does not act as a shield. The intuition for this is if you're sitting on moon, on the moon and you look at the night sky, Earth covers less than 1%, okay? And finally, you might think that, oh, gravity is gonna soak up more asteroids and uh, protect the moon. It turns out some models even show that gravity will make more asteroids hit the moon because it's gonna pull, pull asteroids that would not hit the moon into the moon's trajectory, okay? So, um, all right, so the, the, this is beyond my knowledge, but apparently the, the reason that there are more craters on the, uh, rather there's fewer craters on our side is due to lunar activity, volcanic activity. Lunar volcanic activity, there you go. So volcanoes have spewed out lava and it has covered the craters and that's why there's none, okay. Anyways, um, what am I getting at? Well, I could have just told you this from the beginning that, the, that there's more craters on the 
other side because of volcanoes. And I don't think that that would have been the best lecture. That would not have been a very engaging lesson. I think it's good to get students to explore, think, form hypotheses, and then find out that there's uh, something wrong. And that brings camaraderie, that brings, that brings them, it makes them invested into the class. Um, I actually haven't proven that this is a better way to teach, but uh, maybe I would test that using a math model. Okay, no, I'm joking. I'll assume that that's a better way to teach. And actually, let's show you a little bit of science as to why that is a better way to teach. Okay, so um, in my opinion, this is like the core, this is the crux of my talk, okay? If you're only going to take away one thing from this talk, I think it's the following. This is Atkinson Schifrin's multi-store modeling, um, multi-store model for learning. Atkin Schifrin are uh, psychologists and educa educators. So... Uh, this is their theory about how people learn. Stimulus enters your sensory memory, which only lasts one to three seconds. And then some of it will go into the working memory. The working memory lasts about three to 20 seconds. You can hold about four to nine items, okay? And then some of it will get encoded into the long-term memory. Now, in order for us to talk about why active learning is good, I need a working definition for learning. And I like Krishner Sweller Clark's definition. Learning is the change in long-term memory. So that resonates with me because if someone learns something and forgets, they didn't learn anything. We don't really care about that. If something comes into their even working memory and it doesn't get encoded, they didn't learn anything, okay? So we want to change in long-term memory. And this is the crux as to why active learning is good. Active learning focuses on these two aspects, rehearsal and retrieval, okay? So according to Atkin Schifrin, if you want to really develop the long-term memory, you need this retrieval process. And a lot of things gets forgotten if you don't rehearse it. Your, your working memory only lasts about 20 seconds. So the, the, other than obviously active learning is good, the, the theory as to why active learning is good is because it develops, it fosters rehearsal and retrieval. When students are engaged, uh, they're going to do this and they're more likely to change in the long-term memory. Okay, uh, perhaps more important than rehearsal and retrieval though is, uh, is, this, is the stimulus part. If you, I'm auditing undergrad classes now, and I notice a lot of my classmates are totally distracted. They're on the smartphone. They're not paying attention. And if they're not paying attention, they're not going to learn anything. Perhaps I shouldn't even talk about active learning yet. You need to present something so that students actually want to follow. Now, you can just say it's the student's job to pay attention. It's not your job. That's, that's very reasonable. It is their job. But if you want to make a big difference, if you want to influence, I think it's good to think about what the students want. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about what students actually want so that they're more likely to pay attention. Okay, and uh, final, final thought of uh, why active learning, I think traditional lectures are okay, passive learning, that they, they lay out the information in a sensible way for students to, to take it in, but students don't do much. They're passive. They're not, they're not sitting and learning, so they don't, they don't do much rehearsal or retrieval. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about influence now. This is a bit of a side topic, but I really believe in uh, my homeboy, Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People. It's a very, very famous book, very influential book. So the crux of this book is the following story that Dale will tell. Personally, I am very fond of strawberries and cream, but I have found fish prefer worms. So when I went fishing, I didn't bait the hook with strawberries and cream, rather I dangled a worm or grasshopper in front of the fish. So people don't care about what you want. People care about what they want. And the crux to influence people is to know what they want, okay? I used to teach math because I was interested in it. I thought it was interesting. And I would teach with, as though I was a student, but I'm not the student. I'm, I became a mathematician. I'm, I'm a different crowd. So you really need to know what students want, okay? So uh, I think this would be a good time to, to brainstorm, to, the, to let the audience brainstorm. What might students want? What are some key things that they want? out of a math class. Any thoughts, any ideas? And some students want to make sure that they have achieved the prerequisite or the grade they need to carry on with for the study. Yeah, that's a really good one, Having uh, making, making them prepared. In fact, I think that for first year classes, that is my core objective. As much as I like them to enjoy the content, I need them after Calc 1 to be prepared for Calc 2. Any other ideas about what students might want? Understand what, oh, I'll be quiet, somebody else can go. Yeah, understanding would be good. Yeah, rather than just uh, taking a bunch of black box things, it's nice to actually understand. 
students actually uh, often really enjoy interacting with their classmates and getting to know their classmates a little bit, feeling a sense of belonging. Awesome. Did you see my next slide? Okay, yeah, I'll just, I'll hold up on that comment. That's a great comment, Gene. Okay, I'll just show you. So I did a lot of research about, I, I did some research about looking over what students want, and it really depended on what, what year they're in, what's their major, and what type of school they're at. So I couldn't quite find university students. I'll, I'll pretend, I'll borrow John Dewey's ideas about children. Are university kids children? Ah, debatable, but we'll stick with this first. The fourfold interests of children are conversation and communication, inquiry, or finding out things, so discovery, making things for construction, which is why that art piece yesterday was really good to, to have students do artwork and well, artistic expression. Sure, that's the last fourth one, okay? So uh, I also hypothesized without proof that university students want, they want good grades. They want utility, meaning the things they learn in this class can be applied outside of this class and the social and enjoyment aspect. Okay, so I think if you wanna make a difference in your student's life, think about what they want. And I'm assuming that this is what they want. So yes, you do have to teach them the math, but that's kind of cut and dry and they might not appreciate the math that much. Think about these things, all right? These are the things that students want and that's how you're gonna influence someone. Okay, now um, I'm gonna go on a, a slight tangent about a story that was really, uh, that really changed my life, okay? A couple of years ago, and this is right before the pandemic in 2019, I went to Italy. I went to the Galileo Museum, who was uh, obviously a phenomenal scientist. And in the Galileo Museum, I was really inspired because I recognized that um, people in the 1600s didn't do math for fun. They did mathematics to solve a very practical problem, okay? Uh, for example, Quadratics were really studied. Can anyone take a guess why quadratics got studied heavily in the 1600s in Europe? It's, it's, this is a very open-ended question. But a big extent as to why quadratic got studied was because of canon warfare. Okay. Yeah. This part, this part really surprised me because then there were a lot of there were like sheets that helped pre-calculate quadratic formulas. There were things to measure angles, they had tools to measure the, the radius of the ball. Because if you could do mathematics better than your enemy, you could kill them more effectively, which is kind of horrible, but also it served a practical purpose. Math was not developed just for fun. Another thing I noticed in the, the museum was the Cartesian coordinate plane really got heavily developed when they started exploring the sea because they needed to keep track of location. So this inspired me to recognize that math should be taught in a way that solves like the, the, the theme of this conference model first talk about what the problem in the real world is solving the math is solving and then introduce the mathematics this is quite different from how i used to teach back then i would teach limits chapter 2.1 to 2.6 and then 2.7 talk about the applications why you should care and that's far too late because students have already stopped paying attention the way i try to teach now is in 2.1 talk about why we care show the real world problem and then develop the mathematics to solve it. And I think that's the proper way to teach. Okay, so speaking of this modeling first approach, um, let's give you a quiz, all right? I'm gonna give you two minutes. This is active learning. So this is, I believe in uh, active engagement. I'm gonna show you a bunch of physical problems and I want you to match it with the most appropriate math concept, okay? And why am I doing this? Well, I'll show you the quiz in a moment, but I want you to think about rather than teaching a math concept, tie it to, to model it show some physical applications, so show some real world applications. For bonus, um, you can also match the appropriate scientists and the units and uh, the, the horizontal line and the vertical line test will fail, okay? And um, everything, Euler and Newton did everything. So try not to use them for everything, okay? But I'll give you two minutes, give this a try. You're welcome to type up answers as soon as you, you see them, as soon as you, you think of them. Yeah, credit card debts definitely is arithmetic with negative numbers. Four, two, C. Okay, so four radioactive decay involves exponential functions. Excellent. And it's Marie Curie. Yeah, that's exactly right. Awesome.
six matches with D. Volume of my dog is indeed solids of revolution, along with uh, Dr. Dogma Frosted. That's right. <laughs> so that, that is a bit of a joke. I don't think there's a dogma Frosted, but I like dogs, as I said. Five. VB5 is tidal locking. Yeah, differential equations. Yeah, big physics problems give me differential equations. And uh, seven, yeah, Isaac Newton, heavenly bodies. I think, yeah, I try not to attribute everything to Newton, but but planetary motions is uh, Newton. Hey, Roy Anderson, awesome, that's my homeboy. Yeah, that's awesome. Roy Anderson's my homeboy. I'm glad someone got that, all right? Yeah, I, I really like SIR equations and all that. Uh, path to the base reproduction number. 1B, differential equations, that's right. Okay, awesome. So um, what am I trying to do here? One, active learning. I don't want to talk the whole time. I believe it's important to get people to think so you can uh, recall, well, what's the important thing? Yeah, recalling and rehearsal. And secondly, I in encourage you, instead of, instead of teaching the math concept first, talk about the problem. I, that, that's my encouragement here. Now, for the rest of the, the my talk, I'm just going to go over some strategies for active learning, including ones I've used in my classes. Some of it will follow up with the quiz, but let's get to it. Okay, so um, volume of my dog, Benji of Revolution. So uh, I guess Benji's here. Yeah, I can pick him up. Uh, the, the, the point in this one is uh, I actually released this decimal link to the students and I get them to play around with it because uh, rather than just talking about transformations, I send this out, I just encode it in the lecture PDF, and they can play around with it. They can start moving these around, they can start guessing. Um, I can, you can also rotate it about the x-axis, so it's a bit more intuitive. But it's one thing to talk about the transformation A, F of B, X plus H plus K, and it's another thing for students to actually do and explore and try and brainstorm, okay? I also give students the chance to, I generally won't give them this one right away, where I already pre-coded this. I get students to think about what is a good function that would fit the boundary of Benji. Some of them say exponential, some of them say logarithm, and eventually some of them will, will go with the sine wave. All right. But this, this letting students explore, well, according to John Dewey, it's good, right? Because they have a, they, they like to express with themselves. You give a chance for the students to talk to each other. They get to find things, they get conversation. So it's hitting a lot of things that students want to do. Okay, plus I get to bring my dog in and I love my dog. All right, cool. Um, right, Johan Kepler's was also, uh, uh, he did the, the volume of a, of a wine barrel, how much wine is in the barrel. So that's why Johan Kepler's get credit here too. Okay, and like, I, I, wanna, I wanna also pitch like, you can be impressed by what the students come up with because I asked the class, how do you sanity check my number? I calculated it with my Calc 2 class, 7.2 liters. And then I don't like, how might we sanity check this? Someone will usually say, throw Benji into the bathtub and see how much the water rises. That's a bit different because Benji's very fluffy and I want to compute the, the volume of the fluff too. And, and if you dunk him in water, it loses that. Someone in the classmate said, I know one liter creamers are one liter. Can we compare Benji pictorially to that? And actually I thought that was a really good idea. So I drink a lot of coffee, as I said, and I just visually inspected Benji versus the cream and it seems about right. So what am I saying here? I was really impressed with my students' answer that you can visually inspect by comparing it with something that we know is seven liters, all right? Cool, and uh, now I have this little picture in all my classes because of a student's idea. All right, cool, let's keep going. So uh, next we have base reproduction number. Okay, sure, so they involve exponential functions, differential equations. So rather than just talking about exponential functions, I quoted this interview from TED Talks, Bill Gates during the pandemic. Bill Gates talks about the base reproduction number, which is uh, the number, the average number of infections that an infected person will give. And he says, if one person infects four people, the number of infections will quickly blow up. But if one person infects 0.4 people on average, then the infection will quickly die down. So fundamentally, this is just base being larger than one versus less than one, but it has this real world application in 2020. All right, so I think it's really good to, to, to highlight hey, the stuff we're learning in math actually relates to the real world. Mortgages and credit card debt is obviously also exponential equations. Compound interest is, ex you, can, you can take it, approximate it with a continuous e to the t. Um, radioactive decay. I now throw this problem in, I, I quote Wikipedia, throw students in the deep end and just say, the first person that carbon dated a mummy 
and I let them figure out how old is the mummy. And it's based on a historic problem. And they actually get the, to, to try and brainstorm how might these numbers tie to our math model. And what I like about this is even if the students don't really get an exponential function, they appreciate talking about a mummy and thinking about the age of a mummy and how that ties to the math model. To me, it's okay that they can't solve it. It's as long as they're thinking about it and practicing the concepts and talking with one another. That's already, I'm happy with that. All right, another thing I like to highlight in my classes, I find it very cool that I can tell you how old this mummy is because I know how much money is in my bank account. Okay, this, this really blows my mind that math is so powerful. So I'm gonna quote Henry Poincaré, mathematics is the art of giving the same name to different things. And I highlight this to my students that a big power in math is it lets you solve problem A using methods from problem B. All right, cool. Uh, so let's do another thing pair share. So think pair share is a technique for active learning. This works in small or large classrooms. You pose a problem, you let students think about it for 30 seconds. You get them to pair off and they talk to their neighbor and they just chat. And then they either share it to the whole class or share it to other partners. You get partners of two joining into four groups of four or six and you get them to chat with one another. Okay, so I won't do a pair here because of the online problem, it's not very easy. I want you to think about uh, how to make a mathematical model for simulating title locking. Uh, this is really hard. I found that most people struggle with this. So I'm going to really restrict your thinking. I'll give you a minute for this. Think about what some numbers are that have to do with where Earth is or the sun is or the moon. All right. And just come up with some numbers with units. And then we'll try to think about the equations for that. All right. Uh, can anyone think of some numbers that describe something about the movement of the celestial objects? You're welcome to just think about it and I encourage you to share. So there are units of distance and then there are units of time for like uh, periodicity or... Um, I think you got it. Yeah, both, both, all three of my numbers fall in that category. So this is a hard problem, right? But I'll just, I'll just show you the answer that I had. The numbers I came up with was the astronomical unit, which is the, the, the radius, the unit, the, the, the distance from the Earth to the Sun. Um, there's the spinning of the Earth, which is 24 hours in a day. So that has to do with uh, standard angles. I now use this to teach standard angle, standard position of an angle, rather. There's 365 days in a year, so it has to do with sine and cosine, spinning about. And there's also the, the, the phases of the moon, which is a lot more challenging. So I won't get to that one, all right? Uh, so this brings me to scaffolding, I believe. Yeah, so scaffolding is something that's really big in the education community. So I won't get too deep into the, the games and all that. But essentially, instead of throwing students a hard problem and an easy problem, give them a gradient. Give them easy, medium, hard problems, all right? Um, I'll just highlight that a lot of educators are really big on scaffolding to create a bunch of problems that lets all students try the problems, not just the A students, not just the C students. Um, I believe that your exam should be scaffolded too. I believe that the, let the D students show you they're a D student. That's what one of my SFU mentors told me, all right? Don't just throw A plus questions because you're going to lose information. Um, I also got a really good tip from Brian on the first time I did this talk that I think ChatGPT is really good at scaffolding. You, you can give it a problem, an easy one, a hard problem, and ask ChatGPT to help you. Now, the, the challenge with scaffolding is it, it requires a lot of work to do it, but I want to highlight that there's a lot of different resources online that can help you do this. All right, You don't need to come up with these questions yourself. In class polar, and I said strategies for active learning, all right? So quizzing and polling is a really good way to, to get students engaged. It doesn't have to be for marks. As long as students are doing something, it's fine. You're going to get them involved, all right? So what I'm trying to say here, there's a bunch of resources for students for questions to help you with scaffolding. Okay, uh, another strategy for active learning is to solicit, solicit questions or for feedback. Uh, I'll do it in a moment because I'm actually out of time and I want to get some questions in. I'll just show you the rest of my, my uh, talk. Talking stick, too bad. It's indigenous practice. I won't get into this one. Um, gamification is very tacky, but I find myself doing it more and more, all right? The students love games. I love games. And even though it's tacky, I find myself gamifying more and more. Just make a game out of it. Suddenly, students will be more involved. Um, teaching virtues, not skills. I won't get into this. There's a bunch of resources. So 
uh, this this is what's the saying? The way that you set up your classroom makes a big difference. Someone was saying how uh, you need groups of three students is good. So did uh, Peter Lejiha also found that. Okay, he's a math educator. So there's a lot of books out there that suggest what are good teaching strategies. How do you lay out a class? Um, okay, this is a summary of what I of my highlight of all the key points. I gave you a couple of strategies to do active learning in your classroom. Think pair share is a low stakes, easy one. Ask open ended exploratory questions and let the students impress you with their answers. Scaffolding, uh, let students, it, it makes it more likely they'll try a problem because if you just throw an easy one, they'll be bored and not try it. If it's too hard, it'll be too hard. If you give them a gradient, they're more likely to, to engage in the class. Uh, I didn't talk too much about talking circles. Giving quizzes is good and gamification. Um, some of the key theories I think that are important is rehearsal and retrieval are key to learning. Sensory memory is the first stage to learning. If they're not paying attention, they're not going to learn anything. So you really need to think about what stimulus are you feeding them. And finally, I believe in fostering virtues like confidence, persistence, interest, problem solving, and introspection. Okay, and I do want to uh, pose it to the, the see if there's any. Oh, this should this should be simulated. I forgot to update the slide. Uh, thank you to Brian Winkle for inviting me. Um, solicit more questions and feedback. Are there any questions or feedback I can take? Any questions or comments? Well, let's be sure before we go on to thank uh, Jeremy. Um, my, my question always when I go to a talk by a person like Jeremy is, where were you 60 years ago when I was an undergraduate? And I know the answer to that in your case, but I'm simply saying, uh, where were these energetic young teachers? And when I hear talks like Jeremy, and that's why I wanted him to come and talk with us, I, I think we're in our future is in good hands. That's the point I, I really want to make. I, I very much appreciate the energy you obviously bring to class. Um, and uh, you're not afraid to try things. And, and that that hopefully there's some contagion in that and people who are listening to you are going yeah i could do i could do that <laughs> maybe it's just one you know like think pairs think pair share yeah yeah i mean you can do that in a, a large lecture hall with 400 people uh i'm not saying we want to be in that situation but you know uh, it works everywhere um Actually, Brian, I want to take a stab at that answer. You said, uh, where was I 60 years ago? I wasn't born yet, but um, <laughs> where were the young energetic people? Um, they come from your classrooms. So I wasn't actually sure about being a math major yet, but in my second year, in a, in a math modeling class, actually, so I think you would like that. In the math modeling class, the professor shows up with an empty slide and says, all right, we're going to try to solve, is it better to run home in the rain or walk home in the rain? Where would you get more wet? Okay. And that just completely blew my mind. I'm like, holy crap, how can math do all that? So it was because of that, that one lecture that decided, okay, yeah, I want to go into math. Yeah. So, um, geez, I don't mean to just oversell, but that was very active learning and that got me involved in the math and got me curious and thinking, all right. So that was the lecture that got me curious and involved in math. And I think, well, it worked on me, all right? I'm not saying that you have to do this, but it, it definitely made a difference on me. That active learning class. Yeah. I still remember, is it better to run home in the rain or walk home in the rain? Yeah, that, that problem is a COMAP module. And uh, when I started moving towards teaching more with modeling, I used that project, uh, you know, that whole issue there. So, um, yeah, I, I hope students have these moments. And, you know, it may be a moment that says, I want to go into biology, you know, because the, the question they were applying it to about dialysis was more interesting than the math. You know, I didn't know that the kidney had all these issues and problems, but uh, I, I think each of us probably has some teacher moment or so forth. And I think what we're trying to do in a conference like this is give you enough uh, materials so that you can strike a chord in various students' minds that says, really, you know, I can do this. Um, we, we don't have any session after this. Uh, we have a half hour break and I wanna encourage you to come back, but we could continue this conversation about how to, uh, how to light up students and how to uh, have the uh, active learning going in place. 
Yeah, if anyone, I would love, so I, I, I'll i take any questions and I'm gonna solicit Kerry, feedback. Kerry has a, something. Please. Oh, yeah. I suppose I've just got something that I witnessed and I think you demonstrate this, Jeremy, really well at the beginning as well. So I remember going to one of our mass education lecturers was giving a keynote for our teachers. And the first thing she did was get the audience to do something with her. And um, and that was one of her key messages later on was, and I saw you do it as well too, the first thing you did was to stop and go, right, let's think about this. And she, her, she was, her key message was like, if you can get students to be doing something with you within those first couple of minutes in the lecture, then all of a sudden it, you've turned it into, it's not you and them, it becomes this partnership. And then they're or doing something with you Hopefully they're engaged and you've got the right stimulus and they're gonna and you want them to be coming therefore on your journey with them. Whereas if you sit there and we just talk with them and role model them without actually inviting them to the party, we can easily lose and disengage them. And I think you role modeled that nicely at the beginning. So yeah, that, thank you. It was a, it's always hard to do. It's so easy to sit there and think, oh, I'm just gonna go to this. And I always and just to for me, like I always sit there and I look at what I'm doing and go, uh oh. I've got myself talking to them 10 minutes, stop, bring something in. And even if it's just what you said, that survey at the beginning, I think you've encouraged me to do a survey, at the, some sort of survey at the beginning like that. Even if it's just getting them to go to a culture survey and do something, it's just get them with you, right? And doing something early on. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, no, thank you for highlighting this. I, I you're, you're exactly hammering in uh, the, the point in this talk, right? Getting students to do really means active learning, right? Versus passive. So, so yeah. I, I think you're you're really highlighting the theme of the talk. Um, I want to uh, comment about implementing this isn't necessarily as hard as you, you think. If you ask, mm -hmm. so I, when I first started teaching, I wanted to know everything I'm going to talk about. I wanted to be an expert before I presented it to the class. But what I've learned is if you ask open-ended questions, you don't need to, to have the answers. You can let students impress you and them discuss. So I'll ask open-ended questions like, um, the fertility of a of a, a killer whale I use this to teach piecewise functions um, because they, they hit menopause and before a certain age are not f fertile. I asked the class to think about it and I let I don't need to know the answers. I don't need to have prepared that. I just let students think about it and prepare uh, share answers themselves. Uh, please, Gary, uh, what else did you want to add? You're muted, Gary. You're still muted. OK. I oh, know, yeah, no, no, I just wanted to respond to what, you, what you're doing. I think that's really, really brave. I know that I saw in my research, I mean, I know just being a teacher and being a lecturer that we tend to want to have um, worked through the solutions beforehand so that we feel prepared, that we don't want to look like we're incompetent or whatever. And I know with my research, one of the recommendations was exactly what you've said is that we should try and step out of our comfort zone and um, do chuck out things that we don't know what the answers are. Um, and as you're saying, so I think that's really brave. And then have, and I also think really, really brave. So well done. Well, thank you. So um, no, I'm glad you're talking about leaving the comfort zone. So then this has to do with uh, the part I didn't really talk too much about. I think it's totally fine to make mistakes in front of the class because it virtue, it, it highlights things like, um, <laughs> You becoming a scientist doesn't happen overnight. You need to practice. It humanizes yourself and it shows them the, the it show it teaches them things implicitly like persistence and how mm -hmm. do you solve a problem when you when you're stuck. So I didn't get to talk about that, but yeah. Yeah. That's uh, uh, good. Yeah. Somebody I, else wants. I'd love to ask the the audience here. I mean, you guys are all totally welcome to leave. That's totally cool, but I am hoping to learn something too. Um, I recognize there's a lot of different strategies for active learning, like um, what else do you do to get the class engaged? Are there any other tips that people do? Like, um, I, I also get students to exchange numbers and, and that's for community. Is that active learning? I guess not, but has anyone encountered other things that they do in their class or oh, when Tom. they were a student? Yeah, Tom. Tom, okay. Yeah, so one thing I did that's very non-mathematical and I've been doing this for about five, 10 years now, at the beginning of class, I would put a trivia question on the board. And it would be like, who has won the most Academy Awards? Or who is who is Inigo Montoya? Or um, 
you know, who's the only member of Congress ever to have a number one pop hit, okay? And, you know, the students would get absorbed in that, and then I would always choose a student to read the question to the class, and then the class would discuss it. And some of them were hard and they wouldn't get, but some of them, uh, people knew the Inigo Montoya class, uh, one half the class knew it and half the class didn't and I got blank stares and you know and I knew I was getting somewhere when the last day of the semester I put the last trivia question up and this one freshman she raises her hand and she says can I read the trivia question today I haven't got to read one all <laughs> semester long and for some reason, it just got the uh, class to come together as a community at the beginning of class. I'd, I'd actually like to follow up on this. I think it's a really good idea that you you start the class with non-math stuff. Um, it comes to my response to that is, is it, it has to do with this, right? That students enjoy this and they're more likely to come to class if they enjoy the class and if they come to class, they're more likely to learn math. I actually start all of my classes by playing a music video. The first term, first semester, everything, I'll play Blank, Split, Blank Space by Taylor Swift. And before every class, I play a music video. It started out because when I was, I was really young, when I started teaching, I was too nervous and Taylor Swift calmed me down. So I played Taylor Swift, but I got a lot of good feedback from students saying, it's easy to wake up for your 8.30 morning classes because I would look forward to the music video. I think, I think that's an excellent idea. Yeah, it's, it's just the, the idea that I really like what you're doing that you don't have to, to, to use math to, to in a math classroom. You can use non-math things to facilitate students enjoying being there. And if they're there and happy, they're more likely to, to do well. Uh, Carrie, did you have something to add? I'm unmuted. Uh, just share one of our colleagues down here in New Zealand. He, um, <laughs> he has, a very unique skill that he can ride a unicycle and juggle. So he does that and that's one of his <laughs> ways of getting the students to get there. And yeah, and then at some point in time, he'll, look, he'll talk to them about the mass and juggling. So there you go. I, I think playing music is good. When I first got to West Point, I would walk down the long, long hallway and the class only holds 18. So there's like 20 classrooms right in a row. And you would hear all kinds of music. And of course, a lot of them would be uh, who are people jumping out of airplanes and cannons firing, given as the military. But I got to playing music a lot. And I love music, and especially classical music and heavy rock. And, you know, then the students would say, I, I heard that, but what's the name of that? So one day I played some Enigma variations by Elgar, a British composer, and they, they, it lifted them out of their seats, but they didn't know that. And I said, tomorrow we'll play some more music by this guy. And of course I came in and played Pomp and Circumstances to which they've all graduated. And they went, ah, oh, that's the same guy. I mean, so you can do a little education with that as well. And the same with Tom's trivia. I mean, uh, it, you know, that you, you'll hit a chord and they go, yeah, I think I should know that, but I don't. Um, one other thing I wanted to say is when I first started trying to do active learning, I put them in groups of three and I had this one uh, big football player who just sat there. I told him, I randomized them and I said, get up and move. So I wanted motion. And I'm six foot four and at that time probably weighed around 280. And this football player was big, bigger than me, and he wasn't going to move. So he just sat there and sulked, you know, and uh, I said, you, you got to get in a group. And he goes, no, I'm not, you know, I can work on myself. I fine, fine. The end of the class period, a, a young, a smaller student comes up to me and is asking questions, but right behind him is the big football player. And I'm thinking, if I can keep this smaller kid happy and contain the the bell for the next class will ring. I won't have to deal with this big giant guy, you know? And so uh, I'm talking to this kid, but I'm not understanding him very well. Plus I'm scared of the big guy behind him. And finally the big guy takes the chalk from my hand and says, what he really wants to know is, and he went to the board and he started showing this kid what was going on. And I just snuck out of the room. Next day I came in, I said, all right, we're going to work in groups today. And the big guy just got up, went over to this group. And I said, I thought you didn't work in groups. You know, it was so cool explaining 
uh, to Alan that stuff. I, th I think I'm going to like working with other people. You know, I mean, it, it was like uh, the sky opened. It really happened that way. And so you got to know how to deal with these. Greg? Hey, yeah, I just wanted to share a few thoughts. Uh, great talk. Lots of ideas. I'm going to check out your links and get lots of great ideas. For I'm teaching differential equations in the summer. But anyways, uh, when I first started teaching, I think I had a different idea of what active learning is. I thought it was stopping every now and then and saying, does anybody have any questions or asking, a, you know, a guiding question. And it, after some time, I realized I was getting a discussion going between the same group of people every time but you have a list of all these different active learning strategies and it's interesting to think about I, how they achieve different goals and with a think pair share or giving them time to work in groups you can get a broader discussion amongst include more people and so now I'm thinking how can I get the conversation to a wider get those people who are sitting at the back and really quiet up to the front or in participating them and it's just yeah it's just just something i'm i'm thinking about now like the the relationship between active and inclusion or equity those those two things but yeah so uh, i think you bring up a really good point and i i do believe that asking students to engage with the class and share it, it is a form of active learning it's just you only yeah. get the extroverts that are confident enough to speak to the class speaking so i remember uh i was really surprised that one of the times that there, there were a bunch of kids that yeah it's the same kids that always talk and other ones are quiet but then when i let them talk in groups of four the quiet kids were actually talking a lot so they do have a lot yeah. to say they have thoughts they want to share they just don't want to share it to the whole class and uh, i am happy that a lot of them after they started sharing in the little groups um i guess they got confidence seeing that their ideas were good some of the shy kids would present to the class too so um i think they needed a little bit of uh, practice huh? speaking but yeah Okay, Tom, did you? Uh, yeah. So one of the things that I've noticed is whatever classroom strategy you're doing, especially if it's active learning, start the first week. If possible, start the first day. Students do not like change. If you start this in the middle of the semester, if you start it the first week and the first day, they will say, oh, that's what ex is expected of me, and it will make your job a whole lot easier. Yeah, setting the tone early, what you're saying, right? Yeah. I liked what Tom said, by the way, about how the young lady said, I didn't get to read the trivia. A lot of times we don't realize what little things are valuable to them until something like that happens. You know, maybe Tom thought it was a perfunctory, well, I just read something, but it really is important that they get to participate. So, um, and and sometimes we need to be reminded of that. <laughs> yes. Well, any other issues? I mean, we, we're on a little break time here, and uh, some of us might need to take a serious break away. I'm going to leave this room open. The last one to leave uh, will turn the lights off. I think you've heard that phrase. Mm -hmm. um, and then we'll begin again at four. So I'll let you keep the conversation going. Thank you. Um, just speaking about the, the trivia at the beginning, this reminds me of something I didn't get to talk about in, in this talk, but it's like fostering learning environments rather than learning classrooms. And it essentially says that you want camaraderie and you want people to be invested in, in not just the math, but in the classroom. So, so I think trivia helps with that. Just getting like and from day one right from day one if you make them do a trivia if you make them submit uh with my new tutorial i made them submit a survey of their name their major and their goals and uh yeah like the students can actually see i'm trying to, to tailor the class to them and i think that makes the class more uh more of a learning environment than just a classroom um thanks a lot for sharing all your all your experiences I, I just one other idea that I'm working on because you, there was a, some discussion uh, about how we can get other people on board with this because um, I'd love to see it active learning and all these other wonderful techniques being used not just in my classroom but in my colleagues' classrooms as well. Um, 
and I, I don't know how to how to solve that problem. It's not an easy one, but I do see a lot of new instructors coming in and saying, hey, I'd love to use your slides, your worksheets, whatever. Can you put something into your curriculum that says, yes, you can use my worksheets. It already has active learning strategies in it. Um, use them as you like. Like that, that's another way to, to go about ah, solving. That's a really good idea. Yeah. So then um, I never thought about that. But when I share my slides, when I do, um, my slides actually have like breakout discussion. So they, they implicitly have active learning in it. They have examples and they have ah. something that explicitly say think pair share. I mean, no, I don't do that, but I should. And that kind of forces that when people copy it, they'll, oh, hey, it's it's built into the lecture. I never thought about that, but that's actually a really good idea. To... Yeah, I don't do it either. And I'm wondering maybe I could, because I know others are using my slides when they're teaching for the first time or something. So other right. resources, but yeah. anyways, I didn't, I didn't, uh, yeah. Thank you for, for all the wonderful ideas and discussion. It was a great talk. Actually, can I can I want to uh, bring? I never thought about convincing colleagues about active learning, so I just want to have an idea. With uh, I don't mean to give you, but um, I think to to get them to to change your colleagues, you need to think about what your colleagues want. So maybe for newer ones, I think it's teaching evaluations. So maybe say like, hey, your your teaching evaluations engagement is low, and then say like, hey, active learning would help bolster that. Older professors, geez, I don't know, man. Getting older professors to change that way, I'm not sure. That that's a lot trickier, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was uh, another session last week, and I think they can, I, I, I just, I, I feel like the way to change the, the culture is to focus on those that are willing to adopt yeah. Uh, yeah. these great ideas, and, and then eventually the, those that, that aren't interested will retire. And that's exactly, <laughs> yeah. So I, should, I, I like you got me thinking that the the lecture notes I shared with the class, I used to give them a shitty version of my own notes. I can't do that. Yeah. I need to give them the act of learning to change the culture. So I think I think I'm gonna take that idea from from you. Well, I don't know if you have. Do you have teaching assistants that give studios or recitations or whatever they call it? And uh, so Langara College is a community college, so I'm not there, but at the university, yes, I do. So SFU would, yeah. yeah okay. SFU does, yeah. Uh, thanks for sharing all your uh, stories and, and your experience. Yes, you asked me a really good question about changing the culture. That's something I'll need. Yeah, yeah. it's, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, it's something something to think about for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, take Thank care. You. Yeah, take care, Greg. Yeah. Thank you.